Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, sitting through all the presentations so far. Please uh, hold your breath and we'll finish it very quickly. Um, so for our design project, we had uh, the structural design of a bus transit maintenance building. Um, so our team, ANT, which is accountable and trustworthy engineering, uh, we had a diverse group of people here. Uh, myself, Mohammed Ansari from Bangladesh. Uh, you can actually color match that map. <laughs> uh, this is Raul Torres, he was the design engineer. This is Mashri Kurani, he was the geotech engineer. Brendan Murphy, he was the uh, estimating engineer. And Felix Gare, our structural engineer. Okay, just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about in the presentation today. First of all, background and deliverables, then we move on to the superstructure design, including the modeling of the loads and the selection of steel members. Then we're going to talk about the substructure design and the considerations therein. Moving on to the project drawings and the drafting process, then the cost estimate, and we'll clue up with a few sustainability considerations and concerns. Okay, so the background of this project. Um, this is a bus transit maintenance building <coughs> located in uh, somewhere in Western Canada. Uh, for disclosure reasons, we're not allowed to say, but our, our client was uh, able to give us guidance as to uh, all the relevant design considerations when uh, working with the code. Uh, our deliverables consisted of uh, the AutoCAD render drawings, an S-frame model, and a report detailing our design methodology. So we are going to start with our structural design. Uh, we start with the S-frame model once we receive the architectural package. What we did is we looked at the architectural package, we figured out where the columns were, and we started putting in them, uh, putting them in as nodes, uh, which is in a 3D plane as X, Y, and Z coordinate axis. Uh, once the nodes <coughs> were in place for the columns, what we did is we connected them, uh, making them members, which made them columns. Once the columns were in shape, we could see where our floors were, and we put them with our floors and our roofs. Uh, th once those were in, those are our diaphragms, uh, which we connected them as rigid. Uh, Phil will explain them later on. Uh, and once the members were in, we also uh, figured out that we had them all over the place, which means like connecting the diaphragms from one node to another, uh, connecting the members from one node to another, you have to go uh, either positive x and positive all directions or negative all directions. If you go in each direction differently, then you might end up having a problem at the end. So the group used four steps to calculate loads and to apply them to the s model. Uh, firstly, we analyzed the load path. After that, we then calculated the snow loads, the dead loads, the light loads, the wind loads, and the earthquake loads. After all these loads were calculated, they were then combined to load combinations. We came up with 49 load combinations. Uh, so all these area loads were then converted to line loads. They were converted to line loads by multiplying the area loads by the distributed width in between the members. Uh, the most challenging part for this component was the calculation of the earthquake load. This was because the earthquake load ran in 14 plus. So in order to overcome this problem, uh, the group used online resources, uh, help from professors, and client guidance. So in order to select our choice in uh, DEX, we used CANAM and we used their catalogs to figure out uh, what size joists we needed and what size decks we would need. Uh, once we selected what size <coughs> we would need, uh, what we did is uh, we put them in S frame, saying that these were these spans and with their depths selectively. Uh, one other thing we had that we ran into is uh, putting the, uh, the sectional properties of these joists into the S frame model because we didn't know how these sectional properties should be calculated, and CanAm doesn't give you that. So, what we did is we took two back to back double angles as shown over there in that picture, uh, and we implemented them on top of an I beam. And predicted that this is going to be on top of an I-beam, so it's the same section and should have the same sectional properties, and we calculated them and applied them to the S-frame. So two mechanisms were used for the lateral resistance system. We had diaphragms and uh, cross dressings. For diaphragms, we had like a roof frame, a roof diaphragm at elevation 10 and at elevation um, 5.6. Uh, and we also had like a floor diaphragm at uh, elevation 4.6. So the way the diaphragms work is they transfer deflection from one end of the building to the other end of the building. Uh, and the way the cross pressings work is they transfer the lateral forces from the diaphragms into the power foundation. So the main challenge for this component was uh, the modeling of the diaphragms in the S-square model. The team overcame this problem by using online resources 
and fine diners. So for steel design, members were categorized into three categories. That is beams, which are members subjected to bending, columns, members which take uh, compressive forces, and lateral bracings, which are members which take compression forces and tension forces. Uh, so the locations for the cross bracings were specified in the architectural package. The group didn't have to choose where to put them. Uh, so two codes were used to design all these members. We used the NBCC 2015 code, and we also used the CSAS 16 slash 14 steel design code. So in order to reduce our cost, and in order to come up with the most efficient members, the, the team used the lightest sections as suggested by the steel handbook. The main challenge for this component was uh, using beams with less depth in restricted, in restricted areas like offices. So what the team did is we used beams in between other beams in order to reduce the loads taken by those beams. So as Phil just suggested that we check the uh, most efficient members first and we estimated uh, what they should be. Then we uh, ran our analysis and s frame which consisted of 921 members and 60 different load combinations. So once the analysis was ran, uh, it, it almost took about 30 minutes and then we could get the utilization ratios of our columns and our beams and our, uh, all our members. So once those were in, what we did is we took screenshots of these because every time we ran it, it took 30 minutes uh, and we changed the sections accordingly uh, according to their utilization rates. If the utilization rate was under 70% uh, we tried to decrease them and if the utilization rate was over one then we definitely increase them. Uh, for the slab on grade design uh, what we did is we used a book from Ringo uh, that suggested the design inputs. It's basically a step-by-step -step, uh, process to design the slab on grade. Uh, we put in the load, the wheel spacings, the temperature change, subgrid modulus, concrete strength and uh, soft cut spacing in there and the uh, code uh, basically spit out all the uh, design depth and the uh, steel sections that we need in there. Uh, one challenge about this was uh, this book is basically a US book and every unit was in Imperial. So we basically converted all our, uh, all our design inputs into Imperial and put them in. Once we got the um, once we got the results, we converted back to get into metric to avoid any confusion. So for the geotechnical design, we followed a uh, four-step process, starting with um, geotechnical assessment and then modeling by foundation selection, and then designing the appropriate foundation that is selected in the step two, and then at the end we design the other substructures that are flat cap and gravy. So for geotechnical assessment, we consider the data given by our client through the geotechnical uh, assessment report, and uh, there was much of um, uh, borehole locations there and we choose the borehole 6 as an appropriate location as it was the closest to our structure and the data here um, the significance here is the, the, the soil that was there was majority was sand and it was uh, ovationless soil so that means that the soil vertical was not enough um, uh, to hold the foundation together and then we encountered the bedrock at 2.13 meter elevation and then the bedrock was also very weak it was uh, sandstone with the rock quality designation of less than 25% so this analyzation made it very easier for us to do the selection as we have a very uh, weak soil and a weak rock. So we can't really go with the shallow foundation. So our choice was to go with the deep foundation and our uh, choosing appropriate uh, deep foundation was a board cast in place rock socket uh, pile foundation. So to start uh, with the design of the pile foundation, I'll start with the table on the left. Um, so as you can see, as we go into the two meter into the bedrock, that's when we start getting the base resistance and we took that two meter as the value for design as that was the minimum for optimization purpose. And uh, what we end up is with a 747 kilonewton of allowable load, which was far more than our uh, maximum compressive load of 150 kilonewton. <coughs> we also did two more analysis, uh, one of the level load capacity analysis and then settlement analysis, and we were uh, uh, good with all of both of those. And here you can see the drawing for our pile foundation. Uh, this is just to show the pile cap and grade beam, which are the two other components of the substructure design. And you can see the, the grade beam going across the uh, across the perimeter of the building, and the piles are the uh, circular shapes. And then the pile cap uh, uh, cross section is shown, and then also the grade beam uh, at the bottom. <clears throat> sure. Now to talk about the design package for drawings, uh, it is basically what you can see here. 
It goes from plain view to suit framing, connection details, uh, foundation, and lock and grade. And one of the challenges that we saw in the meantime while we were doing this uh, was the configuration for the geometry of the building. And the way we solved it is uh, by incorporating the use of the S frame model and to take and the views and of course the lens and incorporate it into the AutoCAD drawings. And lastly, the industry standards. Uh, we what we did was to follow the our clients' suggestions and also we checked uh, previous years' uh, final reports for drawings in order to, to keep uh, that. Um, Okay, it was at this point in the project that our group came to the somber realization that no one was willing to do this project for free. So we had to come up with this detailed uh, uh, cost breakdown based on our quantity takeoffs. A few points I just want to go over with here. First being that the total price of the structural envelope of the building is about $2.9 million according to our estimate. And Importantly, uh, you see this large piece of the pie here, that's all structural steel, which accounts for about 74% of the total cost of our project. And uh, an important consideration here is that we, uh, we underwent the steel optimization process. <coughs> we did a cost estimate before uh, the final selection of the steel members, and we found that we actually saved 11% on that item between uh, the original estimate and the current one. And then that resulted in a savings of 8% on the entire project, which is significant for a project of this size. This cost breakdown just shows the four items listed in the pie chart on the previous slide. Uh, of importance here is that each of these items listed uh, was a component of our uh, cost breakdown. So basically, every, every one of these things is priced, and that's how we uh, arrived at a better uh, final estimate. Okay, uh, the problem with uh, traditional uh, cost estimates is they don't really count for any variability in the, in the market or the supply or, or what have you. So uh, we decided to run some Monte Carlo simulations. Basically, uh, it just uses uh, random selections to come up with simulations of, and like scenarios of uh, potential like final costs. So the final costs are listed on the bottom here, and this is the number of iterations up here. So you get roughly a uh, normal distribution uh, from a, a thousand simulations of that. The, these bins uh, can be rearranged uh, in order of like most populous to least populous, and that gives us the cumulative probability of all those things. Uh, so that has applications for confidence intervals and all that kind of stuff, and there's a box and whisker plot at the end showing the mean and extreme values. Uh, and one caveat of this uh, simulation is that it definitely needs somebody who understands the data and the inputs to be able to make a qualified decision about uh, how to proceed in the project. This is just a spreadsheet uh, with all the intermediate values. I wanted to prove to everyone who doubted me that I could make a spreadsheet, and here it is. All right, that's it for all of the parts of our project uh, that concern the structural envelope, our deliverables, our drawings, and this is just part of the project where we want to talk a little about, about the life of the uh, building after we're done constructing it. Yeah, sure. Now we want to make an environmental approach to our building, so here are some suggestions that we have for the future construction. Uh, first of all, the construction of uh, waste management uh, we suggest the use of a steel formwork instead of the a wooden formwork, which is typically just thrown away after it's been used. Uh, secondly, we want to talk to address to hazardous uh, the waste disposal. We suggest to look at uh, pollutants such as asbestos, uh, lead, and mercury, and the mitigation for these uh, pollutants according to the U.S. EPA protocol. Then, about the building decommissioning, we suggest to use lime lasting, lasting materials that will last longer than the building itself. Um, lastly, about the deed certification, we made this great visit to the metro facilities here in the city in St. John's, where we learned that they actually use the rainwater to clean buses um, for toilet uses as well. Okay, before we move on to questions, I just have a few thank yous that I want to issue on behalf of the team here.